Today we are going to talk about the last Russian emperor, Nicholas II, especially since in part of the events of those years resemble what is now happening in Russia. During the reign of Nicholas II there were two wars and two revolutions, culture and art took off and industrialization began, but this reign ended with the empire's fall and society's restructuring, as a result of which the radical Bolsheviks come to power. Many believe that Nicholas II is the main culprit for all that happened to Russia in the early 20th century, but this is far from it. In fact, every ruler of the Russian state had a hand in what happened to Russia at the beginning of the 20th century, and even in what is happening now, but let's not look that far ahead. Let's start with the reign of Alexander II, the grandfather of Nicholas II. For many Americans he is known only for selling Alaska to the United States for $7.2 million. The reign of Alexander II was marked by liberal reforms, the abolition of serfdom and restrictions on censorship. At the same time the country's economic situation worsened and cases of famine began to be noted. All these led to the growth of protest moods and numerous attempts on the Tsar's life. One of these attempts ended with the fatal wounding of the Tsar. The blooded body of the dying Tsar, lying in the Tsarist apartment of the Winter Palace, had a powerful effect on his son, the next Emperor of Russia Alexander III, and the last Russian Emperor Nicholas II. Alexander III blamed everything that happened on liberal reforms, and went down in history as a conservative who carried out country reforms. Nicholas II succeeded his father Alexander III and was also a conservative, but for the giant flywheel of political processes unfolding under the reign Alexander II was unstoppable. It was the 20th century, but Russia continued to live in the 19th century, and the end of this led to dramatic processes in the country. Nicholas II became emperor at age 26. But despite his youth, he held conservative views and was against public participation in governing the country. He repeatedly declared that he would stand for autocracy like his father. Nicholas II, like his father, had a suspicious attitude toward the intelligentsia or intellectuals, officials and courtiers. He believed the stratum separated the Tsar from the peasant. He believed in a mystical connection between the Tsar and the peasant. Everyone described him as a very polite, obedient, non-conflectual person, but this character trait had a negative side. He couldn't say no if it was necessary. Judging by his diaries, he was a phlegmatic and closed person. He couldn't be called an intellectual, but his touching correspondence with his wife shows he was a good family man and a loving father. In contrast to Nicholas, his wife Alexandra, granddaughter of Queen Victoria, had a rigid and flexible character. She often tried to influence the decision taken by Nicholas. It wasn't easy for the emperor with her, but Nicholas II's choice was deliberate. He loved her. Alexandra didn't know how to behave at court. She was shy and had trouble building a relationship with other people. According to correspondence, they retained warm feelings for each other, even after many years of life together. But unlike their father, Alexander III, they were close to their family and were not big fans of court life. Not surprisingly, Alexandra was an unpopular figure in high society. She had a few friends and was withdrawn and hysterical. That's why no balls were held in the Winter Palace. The royal family preferred to live a secluded life, not in the capital, but at the estate in Tsarskoye Selo. They preferred to live a quiet family life in the Alexander Palace. In the beginning of the 20th century, the Russian Empire was a peasant. 83% of the population lived in the countryside and engaged in highly unproductive labor. Secondary and higher education were virtually inaccessible to peasant. There were almost no social elevators in the country. The rapid growth of industry contributed to the outflow of the peasant population from the villages and the development of cities. 
During accelerating urbanization, the lack of political rights and freedoms caused growing discontent among the various social strata. At the beginning of the century, mass strikes began in the country. Under such conditions, Nicholas had to decide how to proceed, whether to yield or to advance. During this challenging time in the country, his inconsistency and indecision played a negative role. To stop the growth of revolutionary sentiment, the Privy Councilor Vyacheslav Plebe proposed to the Tsar to arrange a small victorious war with Japan. Russia didn't regard Japan as a serious opponent, but the Russian Empire lost the war with a bang, ceding some territories in the far east of the country. Defeat in the war was of impetus for the outbreak of new mass demonstrations of the revolution of 1905. The government was forced to carry out reforms, but the heat of passion in society did not decrease, strikes broke out everywhere. In 1906 the first election to the parliament were held, which turned out to be oppositional despite the Tsar's efforts. In 1914 Russia entered the First World War with Germany. Once again the entry into the war is accompanied by a rise in patriotic sentiment. Residents put portraits of the emperor in the windows of their houses, and they held demonstrations to support the emperor in large cities. During the speech of Nicholas II on Palace Square, people kneeled and sang God save the Tsar. All political forces in the country came out to support the emperor. Unfortunately, Nicholas II was not Russia's last ruler, who hoped the war would help consolidate their own power. But everything didn't go according to the script. Significant casualties accompanied the war. Military setbacks followed. The motivation of the soldiers began to plummet. The press began to blame the corrupt government led by the Tsar. The people began to walk a lot of gossips. They say the emperor is a German by blood, a relative of Wilhelm II, emperor of Germany. Empress was a German spy and Rasputin was her lover. They all want Russia to be defeated, and so on. In 1916 the country began to complete breakdown. Ministers were constantly changing each other. Cronism flourished in the higher echelons of power. Management of the country became inefficient. Later even some of the Tsar's relatives began to believe that Nicholas II should abdicate the throne. The Tsar was criticized by literally everyone. In 1917 there was a bread shortage in the country, and strikes broke out everywhere. On the streets of the largest cities the first blood was spilled. Troops moved to the side of the rebels. Soon all sectors of society in the Russian state begin to support the idea of the emperor's abdication. Nicholas II abdicated at the station called Dno in the Pskov region on the way to his estate at Tsarskaya Silo. And now, entering the Alexander Palace, he already hears the phrase of the guard, open the gates to Colonel Romanov. Now he was just a colonel. After his abdication, Nicholas II continued to live at Tsarskaya Silo, but it was already more of a place of confinement. He was forbidden to leave the palace. The Tsar spends time with his children, walking with them. Meanwhile, society in Russia continues to radicalize. Soldiers come out of subordination to the provisional government, so that the Tsar is not lynched, he's transported to the Siberian city of Tobolsk. Then there was a coup in November, and power passed into the hands of the Bolshevik communists. The Bolsheviks deported the Tsar to the city of Ekaterinburg. The choice of Ekaterinburg as the place of exile for the imperial family was not accidental. Ekaterinburg was the city of workers, and they particularly disliked the Tsarist government. The imperial family was lodged in the former home of the merchant F. Pati. Nicholas II and his family were constantly subjected to humiliation by both soldiers and residents of the city of Ekaterinburg. It was a shock to the emperor and his family that so many people actually despised them. It was a collapse of what they believed in, the spiritual connection between the Tsar and the people. As a result, the entire family was brutally murdered in the basement of the merchant of Patev's house. In the aftermath, the participants of the execution recounted the terrible details of this execution, how the wounded Prince Alexei crawled on the floor without being killed by the first shot, how he and the wounded princesses were finished off with bayonets. 
Meanwhile, in the deserted Alexander Palace in 1918 was opened museum, then a home for homeless kids, and later a recreation center of the Soviet Secret Palace Agency, NKVD. So infamously ended in the life of the last Russian emperor. He was a weak-willed and somewhat limited man, destined to be born, ruled and die at a difficult and crucial moment in Russian history. He didn't understand what processes were taking place in his country, and all his decisions were belated. He was incapable of calculating his actions ahead. He had no coherent plan for the development of the country. He was a poor judge of character and often relied on the decisions of officials who unknowingly pushed Russia toward catastrophe. Reforming the vast nation was carried out somewhat out of despair. All decisions were greatly belated. In addition, the Tsar periodically complicated the reforms, making unexpected conservative decisions. All this rocked the country like a boat. The 20th century demanded modernization the right and firm decisions. Still, Nicholas II continued to believe in the mystical connection between the Tsar and the people. He believed in the exclusivity of Russia. All of this led to disaster. Radicals come to power who killed millions of people and established an inefficient system that lasted 70 years. Even now, in the 21st century, Russia is faced with echoes of what was happening in Russia at that time. So, the concentration of power in the hands of one weak, limited and out-of-date person can lead to the gravest consequences for the country, its people and its neighbors.